This video discusses the most common reasons why faculty decide to blend a course. Perhaps the most common reason faculty cite for experimenting with blended learning is the desire to shift away from or reduce the amount of time they spend lecturing in order to incorporate more active, learner-centered pedagogical approaches into a course. For example, professors who want to redesign a course around project-based or problem-based learning might flip their course. They might use instructional videos and online quizzes to ensure that students learn the background concepts and skills needed to successfully complete these projects or address the problem without needing to sacrifice class time for extensive lecturing. Or they might develop a project-based approach around a digital project that students plan and work on collect collaboratively both inside and outside of class. Professors who incorporate collaborative and group work into their courses might also use online quizzes and tutorials to ensure that students have the opportunity to individually assess and get feedback on their learning. Research shows that active pedagogies more effectively engage students, can empower them to take greater ownership of their learning, and can pr improve learning and retention. The gains are greatest for non-traditional, low-income, underrepresented minority, and first-generation students. Blended learning can be used to introduce or enhance formative assessment opportunities in a course. I mean formative assessment in two senses here. First, assessment designed to give individual students feedback on their learning in order to help them improve. And second, assessment designed to help an instructor evaluate and improve a course or a program. This is usually done by adding online interactive quizzes or tutorials into a course as illustrated by these screenshots from a mineralogy and crystal chemistry course. The professor, Selby Call, developed these quizzes using photos of specimens from Bryn Mawr's mineral collection so that her students could practice visual identification outside of the limited lab time available for the course. On the left is a typical quiz. The student is asked to name the mineral picture. Her response, silimonite, was correct, as indicated by the green check mark. However, the screenshot on the right shows the history of responses that the instructor sees beneath the question. Here we see that yes, the student answered correctly, but only after entering nine incorrect identifications. Notice also that beneath the basic mineral prompt, the instructor asks students to name two characteristics that enabled them to identify this mineral. Although these responses cannot be auto-graded, the question itself serves as a metacognitive prompt, getting the students to think about their thinking. In addition to providing individual students with feedback, data like this gives teachers useful real-time data on student learning. In this case, if the professor noticed a student was struggling like this on multiple quizzes, she might invite that student into office hours to discuss what's going on. If, on the other hand, multiple students were struggling with the same questions, that might suggest an area of uncertainty or confusion that she needs to go over in a subsequent class. For example, I noticed many of you confuse syllabonite and serpentine. What features can we use to tell them apart? Or, several of you said color helps you identify these particular specimens. When might color be helpful, unhelpful, or misleading? Adding formative assessment to a course builds on cognitive science research that shows that retrieval practice, or being asked to recall, apply, or explain concepts and skills, helps form the neural connections needed to remember those concepts and skills. It is far more effective at forming these connections than study practices typ students typically use, such as highlighting or rereading notes. This is known as the testing effect, and the research surrounding it is nicely summarized in the recent book Making It Stick, included in the resource list for this workshop. Cognitive science research also shows that students learn best when they space learning over time, rather than trying to cram before high-stakes exams. Even when students know this, however, they tend to fall into cramming mode despite their best intentions. 
Regular, low-stakes assessments help students pace themselves, keep up with the reading, and review material periodically throughout the semester. Feedback can intensify the testing effect by correcting misunderstandings and reinforcing correct answers a student may have guessed. It can empower students to ask better, more targeted questions in class and in office hours. Feedback can be instantaneous for multiple choice, numerical, and short answer type questions, which can be computer graded. But even with more open-ended essay questions or with forum posts, faculty can provide instant feedback in the form of sample answers and near instant feedback by picking a few exemplars to discuss in the next class meeting. In both cases, timely feedback empowers students to seek clarification on points of confusion before the class moves on to a new topic. Some faculty also use blended learning to support metacognitive development. Metacognition is thinking about thinking and learning. Experts in a particular field generally have good metacognition in that area. They can accurately assess what they know, what they need to know, and what they need to learn, and they can discriminate between what is relevant and irrelevant. Novices tend to have poor metacognition, and they tend to overestimate what they know and tend to learn haphazardly. Quizzing helps by correcting for overestimation and pointing out to a student what she does and does not know. However, explicitly asking students to reflect on their thought processes during a quiz, such as the, as the instructor did in the example on the previous slide, can help them become better at learning by developing habits of metacognition and also by learning more about how they learn. Taken together, all of these things can help shift a course and students' mindsets towards an emphasis on learning for mastery rather than learning for extrinsic reward. Opportunities to give students individualized feedback and to get data on student learning also helps faculty differentiate learning to meet their students' needs. This is particularly helpful in large introductory courses. Let's say you are teaching a typical Introduction to Psychology Research Methods and Statistics course. Several of your students would resemble Anna, who is a sophomore and has already taken an Intro Stats course in the Math Department. Anna is considering majoring in computer science or neuroscience and wants to learn more about psychological research before making that decision. Others will be more like Malika, who is convinced she isn't a math person and has been conscientiously avoiding quantitatively demanding courses since she entered college three years ago. Malika is only taking this course because it's required for psychology majors and she wants to be a clinical psychologist. Depending on the high school she attended, Malika may or may not have encountered some statistical concepts in an advanced math course. You, as an instructor, have no way of knowing this. So how do you teach at a pace and a level that does not overwhelm Malika, but doesn't bore Anna to tears? Mastery-based quizzes and adaptive tutorials could help by steering Malika to instructional videos, tutorials, and practice problems she needs to learn or review basic concepts, while allowing Anna to skip material on concepts that she's already mastered. You could use the learning data from these materials to group students of different abilities to work collaboratively on problem sets or to identify students who could benefit from additional support. Faculty also use blended learning to enhance curricular offerings. The most common way they do this is to use digital technologies to bring people, experiences, and learning opportunities into, that might otherwise be unavailable into a course. Some common examples include using TED Talks or recorded interviews to expose students to experts in a particular field, using web conferencing or collaboration tools to connect students with peers at other colleges or with community partners in order to jointly work on a project. The screenshot pictured is an example of this from the Thinking Together Summer Research Fellowship, which partners Bryn Mawr students in Bryn Mawr and Haverford's education program with teachers in Ghana to work on projects that benefit both communities. 
When students couldn't physically travel to Ghana one summer due to an Ebola outbreak, the faculty redesigned the experience so that students met and worked with their Ghanaian partners online. Faculty at small institutions have begun experimenting with a very different blended learning model that draws on consortial relationships to support specialized courses and give students access to curricular opportunities that might not be available at their home institution. To illustrate, let's suppose Professor Plum teaches at a small rural college. He specializes in Hellenistic philosophy and would like to offer an upper division course that focuses solely on this. A couple of his students are longing to take it, but he hasn't been able to recruit enough to meet minimum enrollment requirements. On the other hand, he knows of similar colleges who do not have a Hellenist specialist and suspect he could attract a quorum if he could invite their students to take the course remotely.